Hello. In the previous lecture, we looked at building these things called exterior forms, exterior differential forms. We're going to build on that work today, but before we do so, I'm going to take a look at the behavior of tangent vectors and differential forms under maps between manifolds. So you let's imagine we're in the situation where we have two manifolds, M and N, and we have some map between them. Some, and because of the category we're working in, this is going to be a smooth map. And that's great. So that identifies every point in the manifold M with the corresponding point in the manifold N. Now, it should be the case, since this map tells you where every single point in M, where it goes to in N, it should be the case that somehow there's an induced map on tangent vectors and also on cotangent vectors. This should be, I mean, it should be completely specified. If you think about how you build tangent vectors in the first place, in this case, as Direction, directional derivatives along some curve C, then you will see that all the data that tells you what is a tangent vector here gets mapped over under a function f to here. So once you've specified the function f, you should get for free a map that takes a tangent vector on this manifold, which is a some vector tangent to this curve C, it should get, there should be some induced map that tells you a corresponding tangent vector over here. So to every curve <coughs> in M, there's actually an induced curve in N. But to make sense of the word tangent vector, we need to have something that acts on functions on the manifold. That's one way of making sense of the word tangent vector. And what we want to do is work out what is, there's got to be some induced map between the tangent space at a point P in M and a point F of P in N, there has to be some induced map. We're going to call that induced map F star. And we include an arbitrary function from n to the real numbers in order that we can talk about tangent vectors as differential operators. So let me write all that, what I said in, on the board. So a smooth map f going from m to n naturally induces a map f star going from the tangent space tangent spaces of these manifolds and this map has a name it's called the differential map down here. So already the picture tells you what to do, but we're going to work out in components what, what this differential map actually is.
here. I'm writing how we're going to approach the task of getting an explicit form of this induced map F star. It's differential map. We do it by using the characterization of tangent vectors as directional derivatives. And we first note that if G is some function on N, then we automatically get a function on M via F. So doing G for, uh, F first, then G, well, that's a function on M. And we, but now we're in a situation where we have some function on the manifold M, and we know how to deal with tangent vectors in that situation. They're directional derivatives of functions with respect to curves. So if you have some tangent vector on M, what well is that? It's just some directional derivative, and it acts on this function G compose F, and gives a number. So, so far, we're just using what we know about tangent vectors on M. N really doesn't play any role yet at this stage. We just have a function on M. N comes into play when we exploit the additional information that we have, namely that our function is a composition of two functions. So if you think of V as a derivative and you have a composition of two functions, then you should be thinking of the chain rule. And that ought to tell us something about how derivatives act on G, as well as how derivatives act on F. And if you have some information about how derivatives act on G, and then you realize that derivatives are like tangent vectors, then this expression here, up upon applying the chain rule, ought to tell you some relationship between tangent vectors on N tangent vectors on N, and tangent vectors on M. So we'll see it in action in a second. And the way to do it is, well, we just define the action of our map F star. By reinterpreting the brackets. We'll see it explicitly in components in a minute. So just by bracketing this expression in a different way, we already get a tangent vector in the tangent space to N. You can check that this is a linear map, F star of V. We take two tangent vectors, V plus W, and get the same answer as the sum of the action of this map on the separate vectors, and so on. So that's, that's how F acts. So 
and let's find it explicitly in terms of components and then it will look a whole lot more familiar. So we're going to choose some charts for our two manifolds. I'm going to call the charts, say, U phi and V psi. take two charts and you work out this relationship in terms of the charts. And you get this formula here. So just writing out this equation here in terms of charts, we have some action on functions from our coordinate system. But they're related to these coordinates and that's that way there. And now here comes the trick, if it's a trick. That's true in gen for general functions G. But let's choose very special ones that will make this relationship a lot easier for us. G is a general function on our manifold N, but let's choose G to be a coordinate function, like one that just increases along one of the cur curvilinear coordinate directions. example y alpha. y alpha is the function that increases along the coordinate y. Firstly, we've got to write out our tangent vector in terms of our basis. This is a tangent vector on M. And then we also write out our tangent vector on N in terms of its corresponding basis. like so, and then we'll put all these explicit representations together and we'll get a good expression for what this guy looks like here in terms of these coordinates here and the coordinates of our charts. So I don't want to do that just yet. Excuse me. Yo. One question. Um, this um, in the lowest expression here, the phi inverse of y, for example, is this to be understood as the identity of y of g? Yeah, if g is y alpha, that's the function that increases along the alpha component. Then G compose psi inverse Y is just Y alpha. Yeah, so so psi inverse of Y is, is the identity itself independent of No, psi inverse of Y is not the identity. Like, like Y is really meant to be a point? Y is a point in the... Maybe I'll draw a picture. So here's M, here's N. We're working on N. Here's V. Here's our chart Psi. 
Now, psi inverse is a map from R M to our manifold. So it's not the identity map, yeah, it's just I a mean, map. Yeah, yeah, psi, psi inverse is not the identity. No. But like in the, in the <coughs> square brackets, I would, it would need to be an expression that would run somewhere from M to, uh, from N, sorry, from N to R, right? Like, like yes, so this in the brackets, the question is, does this need to be an expression that goes from R N no, to R? From N from N to R. Because S star D should be the CF of CN. In the function from N to R. That, that, that's why I asked if, if Y is to be understood as a function from the CF. Something is funny. Okay, so psi inverse so these let's check what we get out of the end first so this object here gives us a point in the manifold n so we have some point we start with y here psi inverse on y gives us some point and that point is in fact p the point that we're defining the tangent space at. So like f of e. F of p. F of p, thank you. And then g on that point is a number. Yep. And that, that is the problem because then it's not varying. Is, is it the map uh, a function from Rn to R? This is a function from R N to R when I do that, yes. R M to R. But it has to be a function of N to R. But when we define tangent vectors in terms of a basis like so, then we need the functions that they act on to be functions from R M to R. Yeah, so, so this is then a kind of an expression where we have some thing um, psi star f star v on this object. So this is like the push forward. Well, it, 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 indeed, it's the push forward, right? This is what, what I'm defining. No, but but it, it, it is like twice the push forward, right? Like once with f and once with psi, with psi to be n. Yes. So, so when we define, okay, maybe we will go back to how we define the coordinate representation of tangent vectors, because I think the confusion lies there, not, not with this material. Okay. Okay. looking to see what notation I employed. Okay, I'm going to erase the board.
So this is, forget the F's and G's here, we're going back to the definition of a tangent vector as a directional derivative. Let's see. So that's the directional derivative of a function along a curve C. So the function F is from some function on the manifold M. And now we're going to write this ex same expression in terms of local coordinates. Take some chart around here, phi. We have some curves here, and we have local coordinate functions x mu depending now on t. And this expression here equals, just by the chain rule of calculus, Yes. Like this dF by dx mu is actually f dx compose after whole chain. F after uh, f phi. after c, yeah. F after c. Oh, f after phi inverse, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this f, I mean, f depends on c. C, you can specify c in very many ways that you like. You can specify C simply as points in the manifold M, but you could also specify C as phi inverse of some points in Rn. It's the same function, it evaluates to the same number, it's just how you're specifying it, what, how it depends on its variables. In this way of specifying F composed with C, we're thinking of F as a function of coordinates with a curve C lying in Rn. And that's how we get to that expression there. So then, um, why do we define x mu to be, um, to like involve c? Because we, uh, I think that's kind of all we need. The expression df uh, by dx mu has yes. nothing to do with uh, the tangent vector, right? So uh, the question is, why did we do, do it this way? Well, it's equivalent, right? So th this is f composed c on t is exactly the same thing as f as a function of x mu yeah. as a function of t via phi. Yes, but that's not, not really my problem. My problem is that the same x mu yes appears there. And this, this expression alone doesn't have anything to do with the direction. The direction is made by the expression to the right. Yes. That's correct, yeah. So the, that's right, yeah. So the, the question is why uh, this expression has nothing to do with the direction. Yes, but, but it involves C. This so one here does not involve C, this expression here. This is F, okay, so the, uh, DF dx mu is, well, you've got to have a phi inverse in, in the story here. Ah, uh, you mean here? Yeah. You mean something like 
this? Phi yeah, phi of p. Okay, that would make you happier if I did it like this. That makes you happier. Then, then, okay. So, you see, you see, you see that it depends on the point in that way. Yeah. Okay, I haven't done that throughout the notes. So, when the confusion appears again, when, and I assume it will, uh, at some point, then either stop me and get me to write down at phi of p, or add it in yourself. Or yeah. Okay, so this is a good question. I'm sure this is a confusion that plenty of other people will share. So if we go now back to this expression here in terms of these coordinate bases for our tangent vectors, then where was I? We should end up with the representation of f star as a linear map on tangent vectors. So star, did I star star? No, I didn't, did I? Yes. Then uh, y alpha must be a function. Yes, y alpha is a function. And then like y is the function, like... Wait on, let's go back to here. <laughs> so we have a curve in Rm here. Y is on that curve. Yes, y is on that curve, but, but by inverse of y, is y a point? It's not a curve. What? A uh, side inverse of a curve is a curve, at, yeah? At the point y is not a curve. Because if it's only a curve... So there's an implicit dependence on t here. Oh, it's, oh, okay. There's always this curve in the background. But, no, no, this can't be because the, the bracket, like the expression standing in front of the brackets encodes the information about the curve. And yes. The, in the brackets is only what what is acted on. So D, uh, it, we're looking at an expression like this. So the stuff in the brackets is the, the, the f and the df dx. So the, v, the w stuff here, that's this stuff. And the stuff in the square brackets here, that's like the, the f and df dx mu here. Okay. Okay. So this has to be a function of y. Okay, I, I think I understand. Okay. And so when we choose g is y alpha, like so, then we get that w alpha equals v mu d y alpha dx mu. And that is a something that should be familiar for 
from many variable calculus, namely the Jacobian. It's certainly worth taking the time to relate these things back to the original definitions because as we build and build on definitions and as I'm perhaps not completely careful with notation, then it's easy to allow a small misconception to propagate through your understanding. So it's definitely worth spending the time to clarify these kind of issues. So this induced map not only gives us a way to relate a tangent vector in the target manifold to a tangent vector in the domain manifold, but it also extends the tensors of type Q0 because they're just elements of the tensor product of this vector space Q times. And it turns out this map is also going to allow us to identify differential forms in n or on n with differential forms on m going the other way around. So that's actually that's actually a lot easier. You get that one for free, so to speak. Oh, before we do that, I'll set you and a little exact exercise. If you compose maps then doing F then G and then working out the differential or the induced map is the same as doing G star than F star. So that's a good exercise to test that you understand these things. So here we just exploit all the hard work we've done up here to derive an induced map on differential forms. It goes the opposite direction. It takes a differential form on n to one on m. And this always, th these things, 
when you've done something for tangent vectors, you get it for free on differential forms because these vector spaces are dual to each other. So you'll see how that works in one second. This is called the pullback. The other one was called the push forward. And the way to do this kind of argument is you take some vector v that you know about in the tangent space to the manifold m. You act on it with a differential form. And then you use the push forward to get a differential, uh, to get a vector on m. And then that'll give you a map on, uh, on vectors on m, which is therefore a differential form on m. M. Okay, it's probably a hundred times easier just for me to write it down. So take V in TP and some differential form in the dual space to the tangent space of N. And then take the pairing omega. Omega has to eat something, right? It's going to eat a vector and give us a number. What kind of vector are we going to hand it? Well, we're going to hand it something in T f of p n. Well, we have one of those things. It's f star of v. We know how to construct that. So that's a, a number. We can work out that number. Now, that number defines by allowing omega to be the thing that varies here. This number defines implicitly a new omega if you like that's a result of the Han of um, a Ries theorem sorry we've got a function on a vector space that's a fun linear function on a vector space. Uh, and therefore, there's some vector that you could think of whose inner product with that vector here gives you the same number. So if you think that's like the Reese representation theorem. And that's already defined for us our map called the pullback. that extends to tensors of type 0R. All right, I'll give two exercises absolutely by analogy with what we've done here, and then we'll move on to our next topic for today. Here's the first exercise. So let so let F be a smooth map, 
And the first exercise is just work out the coordinates of this pullback. So you can express some differential form omega in terms of coordinates. Oops, sorry, that should be y. And then the induced differential form on m. So this is an element of this tangent space, f of cotangent space. That these, what are these coordinates here? We should be able to work them out. And the way to work them out is take the coordinates of the vector and just uh, the vector of the push forward and then dualize everything. So it's not, I mean, I essentially just told you the, the way to do the exercise. I mean, it's not a hard exercise. It acts linearly on the components of the differential form by the inverse of the Jacobian. Uh, wait on, no, just the Jacobian in LA, yep. One other question um, to like clarify. The dx mu, like just in general, dx mu. dx mu, where is that on the board like actually? There for example. Uh, over here, oh yeah, 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 the dx mu here, yeah. Like it's not really important. Are these the, like the dual vectors of d by dx mu? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, these are defined here. The, the question is, are, are these the dual to the, to the d, d, x mu's? Yes. Because you kind of said that d by d, x mu is neither in d, p, m, nor d, f of p, m. Like, because they live on r, m. Like, r, d, r, r, m. There's a difference on the representation for the vertical coordinate for the new representation, that the new discharge and the vector of mu's on the manifold. Uh, the first one don't use uh, a notation that these cases. You have to put some points like it's x on p or f of p or it's x on pi of p or pi of f of p. Yeah, but the difference. Sometimes it changes within equals. Yeah, yeah, but the yeah. Okay. It's lack of notation. Yeah. yeah. When you use a, a chart, you have to put out everything on the real space and you use f as pi of p or pi of f of p. And uh, in our case, we use the other P of our vector P. So the answer would be both. Yes. Yeah. Okay, the answer is both. Good. All right, here's the second exercise. It's just the analog of the exercise we did for the push forward. Did it the wrong way around up there? No, I think that's that's correct. Oh, up there, yeah. Okay. So this is reversing, yeah. This, this is not, and the reason that's correct is because this is the dual of that. So if one goes correct order, the other has to be reversed. All right. <laughs> that was for that for induced maps we have something you may have noticed which is that these maps extend to tensors of type 0 R or Q 0 but 
I never did I say that the induced maps extend to tensors of type Q comma R. And the reason is, of course, is we have a map from M to N, but we don't necessarily have a map from N to M. We would need both in order to extend these pullbacks and push forwards to mixed tensors, because mixed tensors are ten uh, elements of vector spaces of tensor products of differential forms and vectors, and they go in opposite directions under these induced maps. But <coughs> when F is a diffeomorphism, we do get an extended map. to mixed tensors. And to do that, you also need to involve the inverse of F, which is smoothed by assumption when F is a diffeomorphism. Because F inverse goes the opposite direction. It goes from N to M. So the induced map go for differential forms goes from M to N in the right order to match the induced map on vectors. So we won't really talk about that much in this, in this course. This is of critical importance when we talk about, say, Riemannian geometry, where we really do want to work with mixed tensors a lot more often than we do in symplectic geometry, where we won't mix our tensors so much. Before we build our integration theory on manifolds, I'm going to introduce one final operation to do with differential forms called the exterior derivative. Now this definition, now it's the case in maths that sometimes you encounter a topics, when you first encounter them, they look heterogeneous and there seems to be no overall pattern. And then only later on, when you build up enough machinery, can you see that a large number of different instances are all, uh, a large number of different results are all instances of something simpler and more general. So this certainly happens throughout maths, right? The, you, things are discovered in a sort of nonlinear discovery process, and then later on do we organize our discoveries with simpler notation by noticing commonalities between the things we discover. And the exterior derivative is a perfect example of this, if you like. In your vector calculus, you encountered all these operations like div, grad, curl, blah, 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 right? And you encountered all these theorems, Gauss's theorem, Stokes' theorem, Green's theorem, blah, blah, blah. They all looked kind of similar, right? You did some derivatives, you did some integrals, and things uh, cancelled out just like they do for the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the integral gets rid of the derivative. That's roughly speaking the moral behind all these vector calculus results. And that looked heterogeneous, right? Div looks different from grad, looks different from curl. Now, all of them turn out to be instances of something more general, namely something called an exterior derivative. This will 
pick out the commonalities between these vector operations. And then all these integral theorems will turn out to be all instances of one much simpler to state theorem that when you put it in terms of specific dimensions and coordinates will reduce to Gauss's theorem, Stokes' theorem, Green's theorem, and so on. And that master theorem is called Stokes' theorem. We're going to cover it in this course. Um, I won't really prove it, but the proof is sort of uh, sufficiently elementary that I don't think you'll miss out or you can look at it, look it up yourself. So first let's introduce this exterior derivative. It looks unmotivated to begin with, but only later do you see how it captures all these vector derivative operations as instances. So before we do that, let's <coughs> get some notation happening. So donate, denote by omega qk of m the wedge of the tangent space of m at a point q. And by just omega k of m, the space of smooth k forms. Well, the adjective smooth here is not required. And as I observed yesterday, omega m in that case is just f of m. And then we have ourselves a definition. So the exterior derivative dk is a linear map from k forms to k plus 1 forms. Okay, linear map from k plus, so linear map from a vector space to a vector space. Super. Defined by some differential form omega. Now remember we had a basis coordinate representation of omega yesterday. In terms of these wedges. Like so. So there's an arbitrary k form here in, in it terms of the coordinate basis and this exterior derivative will be have a very simple definition in terms of this coordinate basis we're going to get another one it's going to have to be determined in terms of k plus one wedges take a partial derivative with respect to the elf coordinate of these omegas and you put it on the front yeah there you go there we go so that's the exterior derivative
Now it's possible to imagine all manner of crazy differential operators on differential forms. Your imagination, they're limited by your imagination and the number of first order linear differential operators, which is a big space. Why this one? Why did we bother defining this particular differential operator? Well, we'll see that it's the thing that captures as special cases very many useful differential operators in vector calculus. But also, it's the one that makes the theorem, the statement of the theorem that we're going to have later in the, maybe in the next lecture or the lecture afterwards, as clean and simple as possible. So often these kind of definitions appear absolutely mysterious. And the reason is, is you didn't go through the 50 year process of trying to identify commonalities and patterns in mathematics. You just get to see the end result of this. And of course it looks bamboozling because you haven't actually tried 50,000 different other things first in order to convince yourself that this is the most economical way to state things. So that's why maths is hard to sometimes, it's hard to grok, right? Because you, you, you just get given the end process of an evolution and you're meant to somehow like intuit the evolution behind the definition. And for physicists, that's particularly difficult because we always want to know why are you bothering to do X and Y. So I'll try and present to you a little bit of the evolution in terms of some examples. So when you do vector calculus, you're, you're living life in R3. That's vector calculus. Let's see what happens if we apply the exterior derivative to various differential forms we could associate with a manifold R3. Well, the simplest differential form is the zero form, which is just a function. There it is, there's the world's simplest differential form. Zero form. What's d omega? d omega naught is, well, let's look at the definition here. We write out omega naught in terms of a basis. This already is written out in terms of a basis, the one dimensional vector space. So then we apply the definition here. And that is d omega naught. If you like, this is like grad. Because these are three linearly independent vectors here. So we could just have lined up the coefficients in terms of these three vectors, like so. Pretty cool, like the exterior derivative is like grad. Or does it have other forms? Indeed it does. Let's suppose we have a one form. A one form is a linear combination of these three coordinate forms. Let's work out the exterior derivative of that. This is kind of like a vector, kind of, kind of, it's a co-vector. It's three functions, specified by three functions, a x, a y, a z. Let's work out d1, d omega 1. And this is a bit more complicated. All right, I wrote. I worked it all out on my notes. I don't really want to go through all of this. But. So six terms when you apply the exterior derivative <coughs> to this guy here. Doesn't look like there's six terms, but there are. Lots of them vanish. Mm. 
All right, I'm gonna cheat. Skip a line. it out you get that minus that plus That's right. Yep. So that should start to look pretty familiar to you. Should be thinking about writing out three by three matrices and, and curls and that kind of thing. Indeed. I'd certainly urge you to, to work out the intermediate step that I was going to do, but it was like six terms. I didn't want to fill up the board with six terms and also it's good practice. So that's what the derivative does, the exterior derivative does on a one form. What about a two form on R3? turn out to also be very interesting. What's an arbitrary two form look like in two dimensions, uh, three dimensions? Well, you work out that it's a three dimensional vector space spanned by these wedges. And then if you work out the exterior derivative applied to a differential form like that, then you also get a very interesting expression. One more case, but that's super easy. If you have yourself a three form on R3, that's a one dimensional vector space. And D of omega three is just zero because there are no four forms on R3. Here's a little exercise. If you have the wedge product of two of a K form and an L form, then the exterior derivative is the same. It, it has a kind of Leibniz property.
just take the exterior derivative of the first component of the wedge and then add it to the exterior derivative of the second component of the wedge, but you have to pick up a minus sign depending on what kind of forms you have. And now comes one of the big ones. Big result, huge result of extraordinarily important importance. Very hard to overstate the. Yo, a question? Shouldn't it be minus one to the power k? Um, because we have to use the proof, right? If we change k times two times. No. Uh, okay. I don't know the answer straight away because you have to use the definition of the exterior derivative. It is, it is K? It's the first, the first one. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it did look odd, I agree, yeah. But I wasn't willing to say immediately that it was wrong without at least thinking through how it would, uh, would work. This is a monumentally important lemma. I'm not going to prove it. That's one of these exercises which takes two or three lines and which confers great understanding. I leave it to you to do that. It's literally writing out the left-hand side in terms of the coordinate basis and using the, mix, uh, the equality of mixed partial derivatives. So it's very, very straightforward as a, as, a, as a proof. But look at this. This here, this simple innocuous looking statement here is the basis for a massive infrastructure in mathematics called cohomology theory. So we will briefly touch on cohomology theory, I guess, towards the end of the course. And this theory allows us to tell if two manifolds are homeomorphic or not, usually by dealing with the not part. Cohomology theory is a vastly powerful machine that's been generalized in a stupendous number of ways. And at the heart of it lies this lemma here. So it's hard to overstate the importance of this trivial seeming lemma, but that's... Sometimes beautiful things are found in surprising places.
So the way that lemma becomes useful as I raise this board is it shows us there's two types of differential forms. There are those which are exact. Exact differential forms are of the form of D applied to something. And an exact form, if you apply D to it again, is zero. But there are also other types of forms called closed forms. They're forms when you apply D to them, they give zero. One is clearly a subset of the other. And it turns out that the space of closed forms, like how much bigger it is than the space of exact forms, that tells you about the number of holes in a, in a manifold, like number of handles and holes and that kind of thing. It's very counterintuitive. Like I don't expect that to be obvious. But if you think about how, um, let's say, no, at this point I can't tell you why. We haven't done the integration theory yet. There we go. Integration of differential forms. This is why we even introduced differential forms. We're going to have to introduce, to do integration, we're going to need to have a notion of orientability. Can we make a, can we orient a manifold in a way where we don't have to fold or twist the manifold, untwist it, so to speak. So we're going to start with some manifold that's connected at least, so it's not disconnected pieces. And we're going to imagine that it's furthermore covered by some bunch of sets, u ed, u j. Let's explain what we mean by orientable. orientable means. It means you can cover your manifold with coordinate systems and in going from one coordinate system to the other you never do a reflection. And let's give a counter example or a non-orientable The non orientable example has a boundary. The first one I'm going to write down, it's kind of annoying. I'll just draw a picture of it. 
everyone's favorite non orientable manifold. Merbius strip, Merbius band. I hope everyone in this room has built one of these. Is that right? Can I see a show of hands? Who's built a Merbius strip in their life? Oh, come on. <laughs> and furthermore, who's actually cut one? Well, that's the best fun ever. Let's see, that's immediately your homework. Go and build a Merbius strip and cut it along that line. The best fun ever you can have. No, I don't, don't download an app for that. Do actually go and do it with sticky tape and scissors and paper. Okay, the second one is this, has, it is a more legitimate example. And it's this Klein bottle. Oh, man, am I gonna be able to draw this? Uh, how does it go again? You have this sort of ball. And That's my terrible rendition of a Klein bottle. You get the Klein bottle by identifying of a square, this side with this side, and this one with that one. You can buy Klein bottles. I mean, they don't technically exist in R3. And then you can put liquids in them, that's kind of fun. Okay, these are non orientable Why? Because in the two coordinate systems here and say here, in order to get from one coordinate system to the other, you have to do invert one of the axes. Similarly here, see I'm identifying this edge with that edge there, and when we cover it with enough coordinate charts, you'll see that you always have to flip one of the coordinates, and therefore that determinant there will be negative, at least one. Does anyone know what happens when you cut a Klein bottle along this line here? You get two movie strips. Freaky, huh? Actually, I think you get, do you get two? Why not? Huh. You get two or do you have one? I think you get one. There you go, there's our homework. Go build a clone bottle and cut it in half. Why are we talking about orientability? Well, the answer is, if you have an orientable manifold, not one of those crazy things, but if you have an orientable one, you can find a nowhere vanishing differential form.
That's the big reason. Now, actually, proving that is mm, surprisingly intricate. You do use second countability and blah, blah, blah. But intuitively, it's super obvious what to do. Just take some coordinate patch and take the world's simplest M form on that coordinate patch. And now that coordinate patch intersects with a bunch of other coordinate patches. So this is what it looks like on your manifold. So take some, in this coordinate patch here, take omega to be your favorite non-vanishing differential form. And then define, extend this definition of omega by using the fact that these overlap functions are always not zero to get a differential form in this coordinate patch, which is also not zero. And then you know, repeat as you go through all the coordinate patches covering the manifold. Now, is that an algorithm to actually produce one? Not quite, right? You have to be sort of careful that things are well-defined, that you, know, you don't accidentally still end up with zero somewhere, the form vanishing somewhere. And that's why the proof gets a little bit intricate, but I'll just leave it at that kind of intuitively obvious level that that statement is true. Okay, so, well, I guess I'll say a little bit more about it about that argument. Yeah, I guess I'll write that out. Now an M form is an element of a one dimensional vector space. So it's specified by one number times by this basis in a given coordinate system. And as I drew extraordinarily superficially, you can extend this nice nowhere vanishing M form in this chart here to other charts. So if M is orientable,
So the fact that h is positive is independent of coordinates. Let's see why that is. Well, so let q be some point in the intersection of two charts. So they're not empty. Then you can convince yourself omega is positive in one chart, it remains positive in another by changing those coordinates. Express our original volume form, our volume form originally in coordinates x mu in terms of the new coordinates using the transformation rule we derived. Well, no, we didn't derive that. That was an exercise way ago using the transformation rule for one forms. And if you look at that expression and you experiment a little bit with the wedge product, then you'll see. that you pull out exactly the Jacobian. And so this gives some quantitative basis for my very superficial argument up above there. Namely, if you have a volume form that's positive in one chart, then the property of being positive remains invariant under changing charts as long as your manifold is orientable. Do I have to sum over mu? Don't I have to sum over mu? I am, have a repeated index here, so there's a sum implied there, yeah. Yeah, you definitely have to sum. Sorry, uh, repeated index indices get summed. That's summed there. Good, all right, so we've got ourselves a nowhere vanishing M form on our manifold. And in the next lecture, what we're gonna do is take this nowhere vanishing M form and use it to build an integral over the manifold. And then we will be almost done with our differential geometry and get on finally to the task of looking at symplectic geometry. But that's the story for next time. But for now, thank you very much. Yeah.